Hello everyone, thank you for joining us again here on Rebel Voices in Education, a diversity and inclusion webcast. Each week we'll bring you a panel of brilliant guests who'll offer their insights and experience in diversity and inclusion in education and answer some of your questions. I'm Hannah Jepson, business psychologist and co-founder of LGBT Ed. And I'm Amy Ferguson, I'm a teacher of performing arts and deputy head teacher. Our guests today are three BAME teachers, Arv, Anton and Adrian, welcome. For those who haven't met you all before, we're going to ask you first of all to tell us just a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you come from, where you're teaching. Hi, I'm Arv. Um, I work in Bedfordshire. I work in an all-girls school, um, which is Charney High School for Girls, and I work for a trust, which is Chilton Learning Trust. Um, so I teach maths, um, so that's the big part of my job, um, and I support a department um uh, within that school but i'm also a specialist leader in education and as part of that role um i i do a lot of project management so um two years ago i took uh, i put in a bid for the equality and diversity fund uh, with the dfe and i've been running a, a a diversity and equality style uh program um within the region so it's not just trust based um and it's that's now become bame into leadership um, which is a way of getting teachers from middle management or any anywhere into the next step in their leadership journey. And um, I've been running that, those sessions now for two years. I suppose my whole area is, is how do you make a more inclusive culture within the schools from the bottom all the way to the top? And I've done quite a lot of reading and research regarding this topic and, and trying to find a different angle on things that haven't worked in the past and and what we can do now actively to change the landscape in education moving forward well, my name's anton chisholm um, i'm a teacher at wood green academy in wensbury um, i've been teaching for seven years now um, i'm a maths teacher um, by trade um, that's my main role um, i'm also a pgc mentor um, but I have in the past been uh, um, head of house um, and also um, been responsible for um, other ITT trainees as well. Um, I'm really enjoying my role. I'm Adrian McLean. Um, I'm a trust leader for character education and professional, uh, not professional development, personal development um, across a, a multi academy trust, uh, seven academies education trust in, in, based in Worcestershire. Um, I'm, if you can't tell from the accent, I'm, I'm from Birmingham. so. Um, yeah, it's, it's a whole West Midlands thing. Um, I started out as a PE teacher um, and I've basically done every single role that you could, you could think of. I've been head of PE, been head of year, I've been um, academic, um, a, a senior leader, I, I've been pastoral senior leader, uh, I've been curriculum and data, um, I've been a head teacher um, and currently my, I'm really working on what I, I feel most passionate about, um, similar to, to something that I've said, um, looking at things in a different way. Um, and I don't believe that we get the best out of young people by just ramming academia down their throat and making sure that they get the best grades. Um, I'm really focusing on looking at how we can support the young people to develop the character traits, skills, and abilities to be able to do whatever it is that they want that will make them be able to flourish in life. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Wow, well, it's great to have you all here. Definitely some themes around maths and uh, the West Midlands. So excellent, I feel um, <laughs> that's, it's really good to have you here and representing, thank you so much. Um, so every uh, episode, we start by asking our panel um, some of our Rebel Voices questions. So, um, uh, and if we start with Adrian, because we just heard from you, um, as a member of the BAME community, what has been your experience of diversity and inclusion in schools? Well, wow. so um, coming in strictly from a, a, a teaching point of view, um, I've always been one, if not the only black person, particularly the only black male that I've worked with um, in schools. Uh, I can count on one hand in uh, eight different schools that I worked in, um, the, the number of other black male teachers that I've worked with. Um, so that's that's one interesting strand that I'm, I'm really focused on helping to, to improve and, and diversify. Um, 
I think when I really thought about this question, one of the things that stuck out to me is that as a NQT and early in my teaching career, um, the qualities of being driven, decisive, determined, and specifically blunt and straight to the point were, were reasons why uh, a lot of schools wanted to hire me and I got promoted to middle leader positions. And um, being in those positions helped the school to make rapid improvements in, in either pastoral um, roles uh, and and across the school pastorally or as a head of faculty. Um, but interestingly, I, I found as I started to climb up the ladder, um, these same qualities were, began to become initially overlooked. So I was a brilliant middle leader and all those qualities were what everyone was deeming to be brilliant. But then when it comes to looking at senior leader roles, I started to get overlooked uh, initially. Um, and when I did get a, a senior leader role within the school that, um, I was, that I was currently in at that time, I was deemed to be a disruptor. Um, I always seemed to be told that I was threatening the status quo and that I was a bit of a threat and uh, perceived to, to be in that role um, as somebody who, who may be a little bit dangerous to, to the message that was being put out there. Um, and I think that that made the SRT uncomfortable because as far as I was concerned, leadership is about challenging things and challenging that status quo and making things better. Um, and some of the people were uncomfortable with that. Now, I don't know whether that was about my colour or whether that was because I was this big hoofing six foot four black man um, who was deemed to be aggressive and threatening at times as um, we generally are when we're passionate about things. But um, I started to employ other tactics to get my voice heard, um, such as loading the bullets of the gun and giving it to someone else to fire because I didn't feel like my voice was being heard. Um, and nine times out of ten, that would happen, and it would be, you know, those ide ideas would be utilised. But I felt that that sort of began to co compromise my core values and authenticity, um, and it was something that I decided I didn't like, and I wouldn't do that again. Um, and then when it came to the point where I was applying for headships, I was interviewing and being that authentic me, and and I know that I didn't get some jobs because of exactly that. I wasn't prepared to compromise my own integrity and my own core values. Um, and eventually I got to a point where I got a role where I went for an interview and they saw who I was um, and they were quite happy with that at interview, but that didn't last very long because when I went into that role and I started to be the, be the person who I interviewed and showed up as, um, that, that wasn't liked. And, um, I felt that I was being compromised more than ever before, um, which led to me resigning from that position because I felt I couldn't be my authentic self, which is ultimately what I've realized is the most important thing. And um, the biggest disappointment for me, and I think it was more about disappointing me in myself um, because the driving force behind that executive team that I was working with was another person of color. Uh, and I felt that, they would have been an advocate for what I was doing and what I was about and what I was standing for. Um, and I think that was a huge lesson to me that because I expected someone else uh, uh, as a person of colour to hold similar values to me um, because they, they were a person of colour. And, and that's, that's a big learning point that I, I've learned. However, having resigned from that role, I was fortunate enough to to be approached to, to take on the role that I have now, which I absolutely love and adore. Um, so it's fortified me further to, to make sure that I'm always my authentic self. Getting into teaching, for me, um, I really wanted to be that, that role model. I wanted to be, um, I understood that there wasn't a lot of black male teachers in, um, in education and, and I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to have a positive influence um, on students that um, I taught and, and, and show students that, okay, here's a black male that um, is doing something positive because a lot of the stereotypes are, um, are, are negative um, in regards to, to black males. So that was my motivation for getting into teaching. And I remember during my training um, year thinking, okay, yeah, I want to be this, um, this, this black inspirational teacher. Um, inner city school, tough kids, and I'm going to reach them. Um, and I remember my training year, it was hell. It was horrible um, because I just didn't feel I had that, 
that that support. Um, I didn't feel I had um, somebody like me to 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 show me the the ropes, um, as as you would was would say. Um, and I really um, felt discouraged by that. Um, but it didn't get me down. I did. I got through my training year. Um, I went to to my first school and um, was able to progress um, to middle leadership. And but but still felt um, alone there. Um, my voice um, got quieter as I felt that um, I didn't have anyone who fully understood. Um, I guess where I might have been coming from or um the points that that i wanted to raise weren't being being heard as well um and all being stereotyped into dealing with situations being this this big black man thinking that okay yeah behavior um go and deal with that um be able to to, to deal with a group of um students who are being difficult um and my character isn't necessarily um like that so i i, I struggled with certain um, points and certain aspects of that because I was stereotyped to dealing in in situations I just didn't ever feel um, totally comfortable um, I mean at the school that that I'm at now I do feel um, heard I do feel um, respected there is still a lot of work to be done um, but I, but I am positive and I'm hopeful um, obviously there's more things like this more um, knowledge and information um, does come out into the the, the public arena um, that we will make positive changes. I only came into teaching 13 years ago, um, and I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. Um, so at the time, there was National Front. The, the, th things weren't particularly uh, pretty if you were going to look into them. Um, and um, and, I, and I was in a little bubble, to be fair, um, going to university, going uh, coming out of university, going into the workplace until my late 30s. Um, and... I was oblivious. I just thought, well, if somebody wants to act that way, that's their problem. They deal with it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get caught up in it. Um, and even when I started teach, teaching 13 years ago, so I was in uh, working in Kent for um, for the bulk uh, up until two years ago. I was working in Kent, which in the area that I worked was predominantly white, sort of a deprived area. And um, and, and like uh, Adrian said, you know, um, you, you were the only person that wasn't white in the school um, and for seven out of the first eight years that I was in that school my first school that I trained in um, I was the only person that wasn't white as a teacher um, that didn't that didn't really affect me in the way that it should have done um, I was getting the opportunities like Adrian said you, you get the opportunities you get promoted oh, I, I want to take a picture for the website I want to, and it was almost sort of like this little running joke you know the, the, they, they can't really sack me because I tick too many boxes for them and if I go there's not going to be anybody left you know um, to the point you know where we openly even joked about it now I was in this little bubble I didn't actually know I still felt that the education had this uh, this this halo around it where the society doesn't enter in and has the same prejudices and the same discriminations um and and i think when i look back i had chosen to put myself in this bubble and not look at it because i think you do get fatigued and i and i'm, I'm, I'm finding that over the last couple of years you get fatigue uh when when you see the discrimination not necessarily towards yourself but towards your colleagues towards other uh professionals within within the sector you work in and you're thinking i don't understand why nobody else is doing about it um so two years ago when i started within luton and i, and I relocated um uh, and i was like thinking well this is a very diverse area you know th there's not going to be these challenges there People are going. To, I'm going to see people in headships. I'm going to see people in in senior leadership roles from all different diverse backgrounds. And and to my horror, um, the the picture was even starker. You know, the fact that um, so many schools, and not just I'm talking about our trust schools only. Uh, I work in a lot of different schools and see a lot of schools where you can have like 99% uh, children from main background as your cohort, and you can have 40% of um, staff up to middle leadership and then a completely white leadership team year on year on year on year people leaving people getting replaced and uh, and when I when I uh, started I, I was given this option as this bid um, to put in and part of that bid I don't know whether they expected me to or not 
I, I did quite a lot of research into practices within education um, that discriminate and and uh, and the prejudices that are, are involved and and looking at the government stats to do with um, leadership roles um, and 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 the, and the program that I was uh, put a bit in for was based on the fact that there wasn't enough there wasn't a diverse leadership in education so just by its remit it had already acknowledged that there was an issue but the schools were not reflecting it there's no data out there on a school by school basis and and, and as i started looking at it uh, I, I became more and more incensed um and, and somebody asked me uh, the other day if if the person that you were 10 years ago had seen who you are today what would they say to you and i probably would have said why don't you just put your head down and get on with your work teach maths just do what you're and that would have been me 10 years ago uh, i would be listening to adrian and anton i'm thinking you know what you're talking about you know um and so i actually do see it and it's actually really helped me because it's given me a really good um critical point to go back to every single time the fact that i didn't see it i chose not to see it up until two years ago and in the last two years it's been a hell of a learning curve and in terms of the challenges that i've faced is the fact i mean some of them are blatant and some of them are really subtle the microaggressions that you see from day to day the lack of opportunity that you see um the fact that we are living in a world of data our whole sector is driven by data yet when you want to look at the, uh, a school down the road what's your di what's your uh, mix of diversity in your school oh no no we, we don't collect we're not we can't pu publish that we don't want to talk about that and nobody wants to get to the granular level of what, where the issue is because then they have to address it so and i keep reminding myself of how i was 10 years ago that not everybody's at the point that i'm at now or as adrian is at now or a anton is at now people are at different points in their journey and, and as leaders with a small L, uh, it's our responsibility that we help people move further along that journey wherever their starting point is and then not be so antagonistic about if you don't agree with me 100% today, then th there's something wrong with you because I was that person 10 years ago. Um, and I think we'll, we will only find solutions when we get everybody at the table, including those people that don't know there's a, there's a problem. When we're thinking about diversity and inclusion in schools, what are the things that you would say definitely don't work? Is there something where you think, well, I wouldn't, I've done that, I wouldn't do that again? Or is there something that really does work and you want to share that? Or if you've got an example of what outstanding DNI looks like in schools, that would be great. Adrian, I'll come to you first. For me, it's got to be authenticity. It's no point just putting something on your website um, just, for, just for the sake of it to say, Oh, it's there, and this is something that we do because you don't. Um, you know, there's a saying out there: it's got to be lived, not laminated. And I think that's the absolute point number one for me. Um, I think uh, having had the privilege of being able to sit at the, at the head of the table and decide what we're doing in our school and how it's going to be and what the strategy is, I think you've got to have a clear rationale uh, for what it is that you want to achieve and that vision that you want to achieve. Because once you have that. You can share that with the whole school community. That's got to be shared with the staff, the students, the parents, because they've got to feel an ownership and they've got to be involved in that conversation because they can't be done to, because that doesn't work. When it's a top-down approach, we know you tell everybody in your school community, this is what we're doing and this is why. They'll go, well, I'm, that, that doesn't apply to me. They don't feel involved. They don't feel moved emotionally, um, as I, I'll come to that in a second. I think... Um, Professional development is really key because there's some people that are completely oblivious to this, that they've been going along in their own little life and they've gone through school in their particular area that they've grown up, they've gone to, to university and they've not encountered the discrimination that people have from diverse um, backgrounds and, and they haven't had to be worried about inclusion because they're part of that majority. So they, they need that professional development about what that looks like and why it's important because not everybody is up to speed with that. One of the things that um, I've done across this year is looked at as an example anti-bullying policy because it's one of the sticking points for, for where I work at the moment. It's something that hasn't, it's been underneath the surface, hasn't really been tackled. 
and actually that's because the policy hasn't been looked at for quite a while. So the policy is like 10 years old in, in its realist essence and it's not up to date, well it wasn't up to date with the latest thinking and the, the things that we know now and the latest applications because it was it was laminated, it wasn't lived. Ultimately, the thing that, that works the best is speaking other people's language. What I know and what I've experienced from, from my own experiences is that not everyone speaks the same language. Some people need hard, cold, hard facts. That's all they need, just to hear the facts. That's them. They're, they're motivated. They're ready to go. Other people need to hear the vision. They need to be swayed by hearing you speak about what it is that we're going to do and what that looks like and how we're going to get there. Some people need to see the data. They need to look at the facts and the figures, and they need to go through the figures and to, to understand what the problem is, to be able to compute it, and then find the solution for it. Other people just need to be supported through the process. So it's about really understanding who those different cohorts of people are to make sure that that works. And um, one thing that I know that doesn't work as well is this word tolerance, telling people to be tolerant of somebody because they're different. Why? That, that, that completely defeats the object. We need to accept people. It's acceptance that the thing is, it's accepting that we're all different and we all have our own individuality, our own quirks, our, ho our own different cultural backgrounds and accepting that, that we are different, but we're all working towards a common goal and treating everyone in that equitable way to make sure that it's there. I don't think it works when it is just that, that one person, that um, diversity and inclusion um, supervisor or um, that token um, black teacher, right? Can you go stand up and speak about Black History Month? Um, I don't think that works. Um, it definitely has to be um, everyone um, singing from um, the, the same hymn, hymn sheet and, and really pushing together for an initiative that the school has um, decided on um, for their pupils. Um, I personally, and it's something, not something that I've done, but something that have, I've experienced, um, being singled out, even in um, small groups. Um, okay, these are um, our group of black boys that we need to reach. Um, and being taken to a separate room and and, and spoken to because um, you really think that okay there's 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 something wrong um, what what have I done wrong what makes um, me have to be be, be taken out um, and again probably helps with that that whole school initiative thing it's everybody that um, needs to um, learn about um, diversity and inclusion it's everybody that needs to um, have a responsibility and have um, ownership on it um, we're not um, Yes, it's important to, to identify groups of people that um, are probably not being rep represented, um, but to, to, to physically take them out of lessons and um, um, section them off. I, I think it does a bit more harm than, than good, um, in my opinion. How do you change hearts and minds when it comes to that? If you're encountering resistance, what can you do? Um, what practical strategies could you offer somebody to say, you know, this is how we're all going to move things forward together. If we actually want sustainable change, you have, first of all, you have got to have a whole school, a whole team, a whole trust, a whole sector involvement. So that, that, that's the first thing. And with that comes the fact that you are going to have people that um, are inspired in different ways. So I'm going to choose to go down that route. You know, you've, you've got to inspire people to, to, to change hearts and minds. Um, and and just by that very nature, you, you have to find different ways to inspire them. And like he quite rightly said, some people will be driven by um, those stories, those really emotive stories that, you, that are out there. You don't have to search that hard about what people have gone through, whether they're outside of the education sector or within. And some people will be. Um, the, the other side of it is, is that what I'm focusing on, and, and, and I kind of agree what Adrian said and Anton said, but to have a whole school approach or a whole trust approach, it has to be a strategic intentional decision. Okay, how they do that is a different thing. Um, so um, tick boxes people hate. It, it's the hearts and minds in, in terms of what you asked is what we're looking for. And, and I'm gonna refer you back to what I said earlier is that people are at different points of their journey. The biggest mistake you can make is that everybody will see what you see. 
They won't. And if you try and ram that down people's throat, they will close their eyes because the picture isn't good. The picture isn't good. Who wants to look at a picture that's not good? You know, if you can get on with your 90% of your day without having to think about these things, you're going to do that because, because you do get tired of it. it. It is something that drains your emotions on a daily basis. So I get it, and I've been through that myself, where you have to switch off because it just saps every bit of – and it affects your family life, affects your friends, affects relationships, all those different things that matter and keep us strong. So you've got to uh, – You've got to empathize with that situation when you're talking to anybody that you're trying to engage in your conversation is that they're not always going to see what you see. And some people will see more than you see and may approach it in a different way. And you've still got to have them on board. And the biggest thing that I've learned is, is not to allow an opportunity to slide. All the momentum that's been gained up until the end of July Six weeks will destroy that, and we'll start in September, and we'll be, no, that's, re that's really important, but this is more important. We need to focus on our students coming back and all the rest of it. And I've always thought that if you can't see the value in me and what I bring to the table, how the hell are you going to value the students that I'm teaching that come from these different backgrounds? You know, you've got to value me as much as you value my my diverse students. And if you don't do that, then you're not allowing everything to come to the table. Uh, and so it's finding different ways of engaging with people. So webinars, discussions, blogs, one on one conversations, whatever suits. Um, but have that in the back of your mind that not everybody's going to engage in the way that you want them to engage the first time, the second time, the third time, or perhaps never in some cases. Uh, and you've got to be OK with that. Thanks so much, um, all. Um, I just just a question from me because it, it, I feel like it's kind of it's come up a few times now with with all of you really. What kind of um, advice would you give to someone? And and I think we've talked about this before that if you're part of a um, minoritized or marginalized group, um, sometimes the onus is put on you to solve the problem, and that can have a massive take a massive you know toll on your kind of personal well-being kind of so what advice would you give to someone who is coming up into the profession um who might be you know um yeah member of the BAME community um who kind of wants to do some of this work but also you know doesn't want the pressure of taking it all on so has anyone got any advice on kind of how you marry those two things up um, I found it really helpful. Um, obviously, it might might just be the time we find in ourselves in, but um, the amount of literature that is out there, the amount of um, information that is out there, um, and the black curriculum is something that um, I've I've been spending my a lot of my time reading and and, and following, and um, it's given me so much insight into um, things that I've thought there's something wrong, and I can't put my finger on it. Um, and 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 seeing people speaking out against it it's really um giving me a bit bit of motivation to be able to be confident to, to speak about these things um as a young teacher um i still feel um i think it's important um that we do are allowed to to, to ask those ask those questions um that we are allowed to to, to make mistakes um so i think forums like this um having things like the black curriculum, having um, yourselves to, to speak to um, and making yourselves available to speak to is something that I think as a, as a teacher coming up is, is very important. I mean, I've, I've had this happen to, to, to myself a number of times. It's like, because you're the black face, people expect you to have the answers to a problem that's not essentially yours. Um, so it's really important to, to read the literature and what I've advised some people to do is signpost people to that literature, to different websites, to different curriculum ideas. And so they're not the spokesperson for it because we, we don't have the answers because it's not our issue. Um, it affects us, but it's not our issue to solve. So we, we can do the signposting. Um, and, and that's what I would really recommend to people. To, to be well versed in knowing where that information is and not to be the one who's standing on the rooftop shouting this is the solutions because actually you shouldn't be doing that that's not your role i i completely agree um in, in the sense that um this this impacts us 
but it's not ours to solve and that's why i why i'm really sort of looking for that inclusive approach is is that and if you're early on in your career um i think having uh, some kind of allyship somewhere no matter who that is uh the good critical honest friend uh, and that, that's just general in, in QT advice, to be fair, is the fact that you've got to have someone that you can just blurt out to, no matter what it is, unfiltered, and that person's going to help you see a way through that situation, uh, help you find the solutions yourself. Uh, but for those people that are um, further on in their careers, especially, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, how do I... How do I navigate this? Because if I don't, if I don't speak up, that's what people think. If I don't speak up, then no one's going to speak up. And if I'm the only person that is of uh, of color of any description, um, that leaves no one else to talk about it. So you feel that burden, that pressure of thinking, well, if I want things to change, then it's going to have to be me. Uh, and then I'd go back to that approach. Yeah, it can be you, but not just you direct people we're past that point of let's do some more research let's do some more of this explain to me wh why there's an issue you say this is where i've learned what i'm what, what you know what you're asking me go and read this and then, then let's have another conversation but make sure you have that conversation after they've read it if they are genuine they will go ahead and read some of it if not all of it and then you can have that conversation if this if it's just a passing conversation they won't read it you'll never have that conversation again, but it doesn't stop you asking. That doesn't make you an advocate for it, but it's just a follow-up as you do with anybody. You know, you asked me about this. Did you find out anything more about it? Put the onus on that person. Um, it, you know, it's all of our responsibility. If we want change, all of us have to take that responsibility. Do speak up and make sure that you don't make yourself the only person that speaks. Thank you very much. Um, and the second part of the webcast, we um, answer questions and dilemmas from um, our viewers and we've taken some in from Twitter, we've taken some in from Gmail. So I'm going to just uh, pose one to you today. So, hello Rebels, I'm a woman of colour working in a large secondary school. After the recent events in America, my school wants to do a specific anti-racism week. I am worried because this feels tokenistic, but that if we don't do at least this, then my school won't do anything to improve diversity in our school. Mm, that's, that was one of my um, things that I felt didn't work. The Black History Month, the, the Black History Week, as it in it is in um, some schools, because um, it is then forgotten about. Um, I think something that I'm definitely going to, going to be doing is is being a bit um, more active and, and and speak about okay what can we do after this what's what's going to be coming next how can we incorporate um, this into our our teaching our learning our um, curriculum our timetables um, moving forward it's important to have that 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 deeper conversation and um, what I would say to the, the um, person who asked the question if they are confident um to to bring that forward to to leadership or if they do have an ally or someone that they can speak to um about that about what they can do next um that is is important um so i think something significant um does need to happen i, I i'd like to think that people are more willing now um to have these conversations i would say don't do it i would just say, i would just say no if, if I was asked if my school was doing that and I was asked my opinion on that, I would say, don't do it, don't want to be part of it unless this is part of a bigger change. We are past that, like we, like we said, Black History Month. We're past that. Um, and as a school, um, as civic leaders that we have running our schools because that's what they are they are our civic leaders they don't just work in isolation they serve a community um they they need to think why did this happen and is this the right response and and i could probably tell you a few voices have said that that would be a good way to start so that's that's something that they need to think about is this the start of that conversation is this a way that the head's thinking my my staff are not going to be on board with this, but if we do this, it may stir that further conversation. And if that's the strategy behind it, then that's fine. Like I said, everybody's on their different point. But to say that that's all we're going to do and no no plan beyond that, I would say I would I, I would I would probably stand a, a few miles away from that. Um, 
purely because I feel that that would be token. It's almost like an insult. It's like we're doing it because we don't want to lose faith. Face. Um, we can we can say that we did something, but whatever we do now has to be meaningful. And the students need to see it as being meaningful as well. Um, that Black History Month doesn't work. It never has worked. Um, but it makes people feel good that they've done something without really having any real change. Uh, and this is the time that we think there are two aspects to our schools. One is the staff within our schools, and the other aspect is what they teach. And both of those have got things that need to be addressed, and it can't be tokenistic again, and it cannot be tick box. This is a fundamental change if you're looking to do it. But I appreciate that if it's to start a conversation, it may be a good way to start that conversation. If that week is a conversation starter, then yes. But if it if it's the tick box exercise to say, oh well, this is what we've done in response, then I, I, I'd I'd run the other direction. Um, but I would be asking the, the real question is what is this for? What is what is the, what is the purpose of this? anti-racism week how is we, how are we going to ensure that there is long-lasting change and what else are we going to do to keep the momentum from that week going and um, those are the three questions that i would really ask and um, back to the senior team um, and then i'd bring it back to the core values of the school what do we stand for as a school and what do our school leaders stand for in developing um within our staff our school community and, our, and ultimately our students as we move forwards, because that's what it's all about. If we're going to make impact, impactful and lasting change, those are the questions that have got you've got to um, get answers to. Just very quickly, I mean, and this is something else that's come up: is the fact that um, yeah, doing it say we're in, in Luton or in parts of Birmingham and Bradford, and yeah, we've got those mixes of whether it's staff or students, and you can see a lot more relevance to that. And I know there are some school leaders and some teachers thinking, well, actually, I'm in a in a white area with white kids, white staff, why do I need to talk about it? Um, and, and I always come back to that, I think that, you know, and like Adrian just said, you know, if we're, if we're creating tomorrow's citizens in our schools, and that's part of our remit, are you expecting your students to never travel more than three miles in their entire life from the school that they're educated in? Because if they are going to go more than three miles from the school, which might all be white, the, the neighbour might, all might be white, if you're expecting that student to go off somewhere else, whether it's uni, whether it's work, or whatever it might be, um, then it is our duty to make sure that they understand the wider community that they live in. Unless the school turns around and says, no, all of our children are never going to travel more than that distance from our school their entire life, then I get it. And I'll say, you know, hands up. You know what? Keep to what you're doing. Do what you're doing. You're not involved in the rest of the world. That's fine. But if, you're, if, if your remit is beyond that, which I think all schools have a uh, remit, then I think we have a duty, no matter what colour we are, no matter what colour our students are, to make sure they understand the context of themselves within the wider world. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you everyone for um, all of those all of those insights and inputs today. That's been really, really, um, really, really helpful for our listeners and viewers, I'm sure. Um, the last thing we do is just ask our guests to tell us in one sentence, so uh, if you can drill it down to one sentence, uh, how you're going to continue to be a rebel voice in education. I think I'll continue by, by speaking up and, and speaking out about the injustices that I see. Yes, um, tackle um, stereotypical views um, that, are, that are made and be that sounding point for um, staff and students like. Great, thank you. And finally, Arv. Um, it's just to remind myself that this issue is bigger than my job and my security. Um, there, there was a time that I'd be worried about speaking up and thinking, you know, how am I going to be seen? What, how does this affect my prospects? I, I really don't care now. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm um, uh, <laughs> lazy in my approach, but I need to remind myself that when I speak up, um, that I can't put it in the framework of me being secure in my job. Great. 
Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being guests, our second lot of guests on our webcast on Rebel Voices in Education. I can see that there's the, well, there's two of you on Twitter. Anton's not on Twitter yet by the looks of it. So we're going to get his details added on here. Um, thank you to everyone who is watching this wherever you are in the world. Please make sure that you like and subscribe to our channel so that you can keep up to date with our webcast and tag us in on your comments on Twitter, hashtag Rebel Voices in Education. Please stay tuned for information on next week's guests. Thank you very much, you lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye.